people uh, welcome everybody to the development meeting August 29 uh, so please take a look at the working doc in the chat box so that's the regular working doc um, you know, got three of us so far okay I'll, I'll keep going so updates updates so uh, big weekend this weekend on a brick press so we had a build and uh, it was a it was a great event very very exciting but I think also most troublesome out of all the brick press events we've built so far just a number of different things didn't go as planned and uh, we ended up shipping off the machine to Utah uh, the power cube we actually left here and I got invited to go out there to there's gonna be a demo demo session at the University of Utah where we're gonna do like a public workshop demonstration of the brick press and everything else so I'm gonna come out there for that and uh, at that time install the code so we didn't uh, we ran the machine with with hydraulic levers we did not uh, actually run the controller so we didn't have time for that uh, lots, lots of different issues. It's like for me, the main learning was that wow, I thought we had it absolutely nailed and everything is down, down pat. But no, there were there were a few issues, including I mean, a lot of lot of things like part part cutting CNC. I mean, we're actually missing two parts from the CNC cut shop, the the, the part order um, on the engine. We actually couldn't get the bolts to mount the pump. Like there were these obscure M7 bolts that it looks like that are used to mount the pump mount to the engine they just weren't available at local stores and like we had m6 m8 it was m7 and it didn't say anything about that in the manual so we kind of had to search around so a lot of different details which prevented us from getting total perfection of this but i think altogether the the whole crew had a great uh, great time great learning experience for everybody uh, i definitely look forward to how the machine is going to be used in, in the natural building and um, design build bluff program at the university of utah so that's excellent but really showing that yeah we still got to keep going uh the redesign i mean yeah it worked uh, there was actually one mistake in the cam files like the one of the plates just did not line up uh, a couple of details the drawer was excellent with the 3d printed drawer guides that that worked really well i was glad for that the cylinder was a was a nightmare uh, to cut it so we had a 16 inch cylinder we cut it down to an 8 inch cylinder nightmare to actually weld it up and it had a lot of it had like three little pinhole leaks and then to fix it took like two hours uh, so that's like that's a lot like in a workshop like this two hours is like really unacceptable um, so basically as you know when I re-welded the little pinhole another would show up and I had to go through that like 20 times before everything was actually perfectly sealed and it's a high pressure cylinder 3000 psi so has to be all tight but a new adventure we've never done that we never cut up a cylinder to actually shorten it and make our own because we can't get the right one for this thing so it's still like a little uh part sourcing issue there that we're going through um and on a document you can look at um if you look at the document i'm going to share my screen now just to go over some of the results here um you can click on the CB press there for some of the build uh, postings on Facebook. I still have to do a, a time lapse. I time lapse the whole thing. So the nice thing about a time lapse is that, so I had a tripod with just a smartphone taking a picture every half half minute. So then studying that whole time lapse over the three days, we can actually reevaluate and say, okay, this is how much every single part took. And studying that, we can actually get better at. Um, better at assessing like the blocks and everything else so that's that's good um the controller looks like this it's awesome i i like that that's uh, it's our new controller uh we never used this system where you have the two individual cylinders this is how the configuration ends up looking there's a pressure sensor there the controller box so it looks looks nice and compact the 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 hose actually serves as a carrying handle and this thing is going to sit on a on a post stuck in the ground off the machine so that you don't shake this thing up because the electronics are sensitive. I've heard many issues where the controller, if you have the machine vibrating around it, the controller tends to make disconnections and fail. So we're putting this off the machine on a separate stake. You got the quick connect couplers. You got the Cat5 couplers going to the controller. All nice and neat and tight. I like this. Um, 
So CB press the power cube. This is how it ended up looking, and it's really weird. We, uh, you know, after considering everything that's that's to be considered, uh, including I'm going to point you to a video about uh, uh, on YouTube about the different spatial configurations. What are the parts that you have to access? And because of that, power cube. Oh yeah, so there's this video right here, power cube version 17.08 parts. In it, I go through a brief, brief walkthrough of the, like actually showing the parts to the to the crew of people at okay. the workshop. Power cube. So power cube. Uh, but you can watch that another time. Link to pictures. I'm gonna put the geomet plus geometry video. The geometrical considerations. Uh, which ended up that we did the power cube like you see there. And that's a little different than we talked about, right? But that's the way we could fit it in the easiest way. It's actually 20 inches tall by 20 inches uh, wide. So tight. Tw 20 by 20 and then the length is actually quite excessive. It's like about 31, I believe, for the overall length. Uh, basically... Uh, stretching everything out lengthwise, the, the hydraulic tank being at the end, the engine shaft being right there, the coupler is not attached here in this picture. You can also look at the pictures on the Google folder, Google Drive. Let me know if you can't see the Google Drive. It should be open open edit if you click on the link to pictures. But that's, that's how everything mounted. The fan ended up being mounted on top. Um, kind of like the fittings were in different places. Like it pretty much shifted around because of the re realistic considerations involved. And in this design here, we have the, what's nice about this, I'm proud that the people, this is basically like novices did this, including up to welding the tank and actually epoxying it on a corner so it doesn't leak. But this is cool that we pretty much had novices build this all together. So that's a, that's a good sign that, you know, this, this device can be built by novices. That's great. Um, you see the corners, like if you look at the detail of the frame, that's not how the frame is supposed to be. The frame is supposed to be flat. But after explaining that and getting waylaid into other tasks, I wasn't able to look at that the people actually, they made it not flat, it's like 2.5 dimensions. Look at each side, the, the, the quarter by two inch steel frame members, they overlap, they, they don't butt against each other, they overlap one on top of each other, which makes it not flat, which is not what we're supposed to do, but that's what we did. Um, and the top is left open pretty much, no no frame, at, no frame at the top really. It's like an open at the top, and the grate, uh, the grate to which the fan and cooler is attached at the top. So that's that's the realistic consideration. And now, can we do better to fit this in another way? Well, I mean, this was what fit well here. Um, one major fiasco on the on the power cube too, which is why they didn't take it home, was we don't think that thing has a charger for a battery. Um, it's a pull start engine, and the expectation is, well, a pull start engine, you, you know, if you use it in a lawnmower or whatever you use it at, you always have some, some electricity source like lights or something else, but it looks like this engine, and I'm not even sure about this, but I couldn't find a wire or the instructions manual which said that this has some battery charging wire. So, I mean, there is a few wires sticking out, but I don't think it does have a charging wire, so we might have to swap this engine out with the electric start version, which absolutely has to have charging because uh, it has to have a battery for the start so just one you know one one thing here that was uh, beyond our expectations but yeah I mean we did the power cube was new new design very simple one using a log splitter pump which we never used a log splitter pump for 22 gallons per minute using a small engine so that's really good it will probably put put out 50 percent more bricks at 18 horsepower we'll probably get eight bricks per minute with this 16 horsepower engine compared to six bricks per minute with the 27 horsepower engine of before because we're using this more efficient pump that we've never used uh, the lock splitter pump which has a dual flow uh, so that's that's kind of the workshop there um, let's see what else to be said about the workshop yeah I mean in general uh, I'm committed to getting the CB press like the next steps in the roadmap um, are definitely to start cutting with our own torch table so for example we could avoid the issue of two parts being missing in a, in a steel order from the metal shop they end up delivering one part actually the day later when we are actually so we actually did use it and then another part we just substituted but every every single step is you know it's time wasted so 
uh, cutting with our own CNC torch table, we can absolutely guarantee that we have we have uh, all the parts on hand, and you know, like a week beforehand, not like the day before, because we couldn't make up for this little error right now in time. Um, a lot about workshop workflow. Like what we want to do next time is definitely have a complete example and complete. Like if we want to run this as a really really top notch program have a sample of each part as it's finished and have a sample of the overall machine as it's finished. We did have a sample of the overall machine as finished with, with minor differences, so that really doesn't count because you can't say that's the exact machine. Uh, main difference being the drawer guides, which were elegant and simple in this time around. But getting, like, we really got to get, like, we talked about this forever now, like, uh, overhead projectors. So if you're stuck on something, you could watch a quick video right in a workshop also a computer station where you can log data like things that were troublesome and we tried that before on individual people's cell phones uh, but you know it's hit or miss so, so we think now that a dedicated workstation within the workshop would help and of course getting internet there so we can do real-time video documentation during this build like we did the uh, during one of the builds of the iron worker for example we had a a remote documentation team like a design sprint working at the same time that the workshop was happening so that we produced an instructional updated instructional uh, at the time of the workshop so I, I think we got to get into these other top-notch pieces of making this really well organized and efficient I'm also thinking about I mean we had trouble a lot of trouble with the welders two welders of the six went out uh, gas feed problems the gas solenoids appear to have gone out uh, and one actually was broken at the initial we didn't see that the gas solenoid, so you, you were, weren't getting the gas shielding on a, on a weld, therefore you can't really weld because the weld becomes really low quality and weak. So losing two out of the six welders, I mean that kind of issue can be addressed by open source where if we know exactly like, I mean I don't know how to fix that gas solenoid right now. Um, I have to look into that, but if it was an open source welder then we have spare parts and immediate replaceability of everything. Uh, as we go along so so just little details like that and also like like power tools for example one of the impact wrenches we were using went out so we couldn't we just use wrenches for uh, bolting down the brick press um, and once again an issue of open source tools like I, I keep thinking about the open source power tool construction set where if anything goes out you can fix it on a spot so that kind of stuff I think that would really help for the robustness of events like this when where you know equipment's gonna break and and things are gonna go wrong you wanna have backup um, and I think the simplest way to, to be able to back it up is that you can fix it on a spot. Of course, you can have spares and a lot of extras, but being able to lower cost by not having to throw stuff away or replace it, but just fixing it is definitely a, a major, could be a major improvement for the program. Next item. So we got a, so this is promo video, like, man, take a look at this. This is good stuff here on page, page number three. So Dixon, thanks a lot. Uh, great job on this. I was, I was like, wow, this is. I think that uh, is Dixon here. No, D Dixon doesn't appear to be here. But um, if you look at that video, well, it's first of all like pretty professional quality and uh, kind of captures the spirit of what it's about. It's a mess, you know. It's beauty and truth and and action and excitement, everything in one. Uh, I like the video in a sense. It kind of goes through the people's experience as opposed to focusing on a machine so I think it's I think that video captured quite realistically what that workshop looks like so excellent job Dixon uh, as opposed to kinda like just showing oh yeah look at this cool thing and sparks and this and that this was kinda like the personal story and uh, um, nice uh, nice expo of what it's like so we're gonna use that for advertising uh, basically we'll post that in the next workshop announcement so if you look at it in, a, in a view mode uh, promo video I think I can copy uh, paste the link there yeah um, if you click on that then um, get that beauty of that it's a it's a long one so I mean actually Dixon if you listen to the man like eight minutes like the this this video is like eight minutes I don't know if you could just slash and burn and like really get through your existential uh, ailment of cutting down this beautiful work piece <laughs> into four minutes but I think for people watching that I think you're like probably quadrupling or possibly even tenfolding um, the number of people that are going to watch it when it's four minutes versus eight minutes because basically the the graph of people's attention span falls off exponentially for the length of a video so for promos you want to be between two and four minutes and we get beyond that five six seven eight ten 
uh, I mean literally it drops off like like the exponential tail so uh, we um, um, I would actually ask Dixon if he can ruthlessly cut that into like four minutes we can still of course keep the long one for those who want like the full thing and that's great to have and maybe we just do even like a radical thrash down of that into two minutes for those who just want to get the flavor of that in the, even a more power packed way but that would be a good thing to do so so you have like a very short two minute and then if you want the details because i think a lot of people are going to watch it in fact some of the people that watch the two minute they might be inspired to watch the the eight minute because it's it's quite good i, I like it so at least i don't know if i'm prejudiced but see what you guys think but i think it's a great video so uh great job dixon all right so continuing on um so so uh yeah film and maker and so page 11 there film and maker ready for experimental build october october 1st which is during the september 30 october 1st workshop so we're just going right forward uh we're gonna do the same 3d printer we are gonna make a couple of improvements the things that we do want to do like uh uh for the next workshop the main missing link i would say like the the weakest weakest point is the extruder um we want to do the low spot extruder um, the one we have is just, you know, it's entry level, it works, but not good enough. I mean, we want to print rubber and all that, like rubber for, like you can print your own rubber belts, like drive belts, like even for the torch table, for the printer and things like that. Uh, I'm not sure the current extruder could handle it. Um, extruder is definite major improvement point for the next one. Emmanuel also talked about, uh, saving space by integrating the end stops with the actual carriage pieces so instead of using separate end stops we would integrate them into the carriage printed pieces that that would be a good idea too uh, i think that would be a high priority if we have the time because uh, we can't change too many things or the workshop won't work so there's the extruder there's the end stop integration the third one is uh, i've got the nichrome wire and and fiberglass sleeves to make our own bed so i'm i'm looking at in this workshop around we'll offer 12 inch beds so basically a steel or aluminum plate with a nichrome shielded nichrome wire underneath for your heated bed so that's a pretty relatively quick uh, demo like i can take the wire right now uh, put the fiberglass sleeve on it plug it into a wall outlet and we'll have about 800 watts of power um, so we can test that for the heating element with an external external relay driven by the ramps controller so instead of controlling the heat bed directly from the ramps you're plugging in a relay that turns the bed on and off because it's more power than the ramps can handle and in fact we're putting in external relays to handle the bed because the the controller keeps on burning out is the results after like two months of testing so uh heat so 12 inch heated bed and that's it uh, as far as the PVC frame, we can go with that. I mean, uh, it's like it's something we can do, but it's not going to... It may work perfectly, but it's just another thing that you have to test over time. So we don't really have the time right now. If we get more energy on a team, some people start maybe start replicating elsewhere. They can test out the PVC frame because it's nice to have a frame that you don't have to... Um, don't have to have metal cut by a metal shop because uh, that's pvc is much easier if you buy or print the 3d printed corners and we have one of the the the, the pvc machines right here but to be ready for a workshop you kind of have to test that for like a month or two to make sure everything is working like you think it should so i mean we're not ready for that for the next workshop i mean if we had more energy then we could definitely test it out uh, in parallel but it's a little beyond but pellets here like okay filament maker i mean i'm i'm feel, feeling pretty good about it we've got the complete absolute um design link click on uh lime and filament extruder i mean the work we did is great guys i mean look at this we've got the full cad we've got the full bill of materials so i'm going to the lime and filament extruder page i mean look at that so that's that's definitely something that we're ready to build i mean think about it so we've got the auger we've got the motors we've got the winder mechanism it's basically just um thermal controls temperature control on uh on an on a heater controls just about everything here let's see what what is the only control the the speed of the motor 
we've got the heat on the on the extruder barrel uh, let's see and the uh, speed on the winder right and I guess speed on the puller so does that sound right Abe we got four control points we gotta just tune them until they just work and we get perfect filament during the workshop Abe you wanna pipe in on them there's four control points right okay um, the, the automated one controlled by the PID is just the heat uh huh. Uh, and then the knobs, I think, on some of the different uh, voltage regulators, there's different options for voltage regulators in the extruder itself, I think. And then uh, there are knobs on the controllers for the speed uh, with the winder mm -hmm. and all that. So, yeah, you just kind of have to adjust that. I think he had some information about, you know, you just adjust the voltage, right? Uh, you can tell from some of his photos. It, mm -hmm. But, yeah, it'll be you know, kind of a little touchy, you can kind of look at what settings he used and then uh, adjust it to those and see how it uh, kind of works together. Yeah. Um, it's not super automated or anything. It's kind of, uh, it needs a lot of human interaction to some degree, I think, there. But unlike one of his previous extruders, I did notice, I think it was, I don't know if he called it version 5. Uh, I don't know how open source it was, but they had a bunch of extra sensors and Arduinos and ramps and all kinds of stuff in a previous version mm -hmm. that was heavily automated, all in line, one system. Mm -hmm. And it was, you know, programmable. It had a screen. You may have seen that. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know that that's totally necessary, but that's probably a little bit nicer to move towards something a little more... Mm -hmm. uh, a little more automated, not too much complexity, but yeah, I guess it might be uh, nice to move that way. Yeah, I think so because I mean the absolute requirement is that you have to start it, and once you get it started and it's working, I mean you got to walk away, and this thing goes overnight or forever, just making your your filament. So uh, it has to be to the point where you set it, and then you absolutely have to walk away. I mean, obviously we're not going to be there babysitting that thing the whole time so we'll see how it works but but he's he did say that that he once he sets it everything is tuned then it just goes by itself right and you don't have to uh touch it or yeah i think uh once it's set up it could go for how many hours i can't remember how many hours i think it takes quite a while yeah uh I for several whiles to make a, a roll and you just put in so many pounds of filament in the hopper and yeah you can let it go mm -hmm. um, I don't think there's there might be conditions to consider for failure at some point fault checking to put in but um, it shouldn't have to be that that complicated as long as people time it out um, yeah it might, might be good to have some feature where it can detect and shut itself off or something yeah. Just in case. But. Yeah. Do you know? Do you understand? So I I know there's the puller and the winder. Obviously, on a winder, you have to wind the filament actively with a little motor. But as far as the puller, do you understand if the puller itself is? Uh, I mean, how sensitive that is, or what that, or can even it go without that, or what do you think about that? Because it seems like the actual extrusion happens by gravity and the motor on the extruder so that's that does the puller actually control the thickness in other words how fast you're pulling it determines how thick the filament is going to be any comment on that in that previous version they had some kind of electronic sensor that was supposed to like control the size of it more but i think he went away from that just because it wasn't necessary, and it, he even had the fans or something to cool it, uh, and I assume that was because you're cooling it, and then once it hardens a certain amount, it's not going to change the size or stretch anymore. Right. So I, I don't think that the size is going to be changed by the tension at that point. Uh, mm -hmm. I think part of that was just he has the, um, uh, what's he called, the winder option with the, um, the level winder. And things like that that I think he did originally, and then uh, 
decided that wasn't entirely necessary. I don't know how likely it is to have tangling issues or the only nice thing about that might be that you pack more on if you do a better job of um, winding it nicely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, and I believe his level winder is open source, so it's might be a nice option for some people. And of course, I don't know, you could go to bigger spools depending on operations, how mm -hmm. you want to manage that, I guess. But Yeah. Yeah. So we'll but, see. We'll see. So, I mean, the, the next major step on this is, yeah, see how robust this thing looks and what controls, if any, would seem desirable for this at the current state. So, yeah, that, I mean, that would be cool. That would be nice. I mean, we'll definitely pull some pull some string. <laughs> we'll see how, how good it is, and yeah. maybe we could actually use it that same day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, there was a lot of similar stuff that I looked at online later more, too. Mm -hmm. uh, different people building their own extruders, and... There were a lot of similar but slightly different interesting variations on this to do, I think, control of filament size better. But, and I, I don't have enough experience with the extruders to know how much size tolerance, although I read some about that. I, I didn't think that, he didn't seem to apply and he was having a lot of issues with thickness mm -hmm. uh, variation on the filament, which, if it's good, filament that's consistent plastic and it's just being hanging by gravity you would think that it would be fairly consistent that way yeah as long as nothing disturbs it it, it comes out the same yeah uh just the only difference would be the ambient temperature one day if it's hot it might be thicker or thinner like if yeah. it's in the winter you know it'll solidify really quickly yeah. so uh you might have to yeah, yeah, and in the summer you probably other yeah airflow conditions in the environment that it's operating in. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, things that might disturb it. Yeah, but it looks looks pretty good. I think uh, yeah, I think we'll definitely we'll end up pulling some thread. We'll see what happens. So yeah, okay. Well, thank you. Um, definitely getting ready for that. So if um, continuing on a meeting here, so. You might have noticed the timesheet. We, we're getting an upgrade on a timesheet, people. This is pretty cool. So Lex has been working on this. Um, and um, it's basically an automated platform. You you just log your hours. You embed it in your uh, time, uh, yeah, your work log. And you just type in your hours and your, your tasks. This is what it looks like. Uh, the demo... It cuts off at August 7 because that's where he just imported the data from our Google spreadsheet. But here we won't be using the Google spreadsheet anymore. We'll just go to osedev.org. Um, so if you click on osedev.org, here's the graphs. What's really cool about it is you can click, like get rid of mine there. Um, but you can click on each one of these and they actually disappear. Like you can make, make uh, what view whichever one all in one graph so this is really cool i like it um very nice so you can see by person this is the overall total number of developers and total number of hours divided by 10 so very nice stuff and then on the platform itself ocdev.org um you basically type in your name like for example slash marchin and i have my thing here my log I guess I have to log in but we'll get you the login you have to log into this just we'll get you a password and then you can start logging we can do it next week so please for this week continue just on the timesheet like normal but anything for starting next week essentially uh, we got to get the passwords and embed this on everybody's um, log Lex is still like just fixing the username so the username is the same as on the wiki so we don't have to keep a separate database of users so we'll be ready to hit off on this next week people so this is good because this will automate it I don't have to go into the spreadsheet and then generate a graph by summing up all the contributions what I do right now is this volunteer timesheet it's like you guys all log and I just go in there and sum the number of all the contributor hours uh, so that's all gonna be automatic uh, which is great and then we can also watch the progress of everybody by person per person very nice so 
Um, just heads up, this week just continue on the regular timesheet that we did, but next week we're going to migrate over after this weekend. So Lex is going to finish up all the little outstanding tasks this weekend. Okay, uh, next item. So the Assembly 2 Instructional is in progress by Roberto. Um, any comments, Roberto, on that? Or well, that's in progress. We've got the script pumping on that. Comments or no comment? Yeah, I... Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Uh, yeah, I, I was um, writing the detailed script. Yeah. And, well, I... I find out that there's a there's there, there are many possible cases for for the assembly workflow. Mm -hmm. So I I was trying to to separate those cases in um, using questions for each case. For example, how to start a mastercard for the current project or how how to add more parts to the mm -hmm. mastercad mm -hmm. how to edit a part in the mastercad and how to assemble more parts within the mastercad mm -hmm. for example mm -hmm. i'm i'm progressing in, in in that way yeah okay yeah so i guess what we want to do is um yeah we can edit that collaboratively so yeah I'll take a look at that more and I think what we want to do is put in as much of the detail and use cases as we have and make it a nice tight edited video because I think this process is going to be critical to our it's a very important video I would say it's critical to our workflow so I think we have to take a little bit of time to make sure that this is treated properly and then we all accept and test the method that we're using so yeah we should spend the time and do the script properly make sure all the cases are in there and we can make additional videos in the future for now I think just a one comprehensive one that tries to bring everybody up to speed on assembly 2 would be good so yeah uh, keep going uh, very important but altogether it's it's as we said we've got the individual parts so the workflow would be Say we have a large number of people, the number of parts in a given machine is large, everyone can swarm on an individual part. As soon as an individual part is is initially done, that can be put into the overall assembly. The biggest question I have for speeding up this workflow currently is, say you're, um, how do you make this mo most effective? Because naturally the overall assembly is going to be blocked by the availability of parts. So the question would be, how do you get from the you know, start of a design sprint, let's say, to the parts that are available for entry into the, the final assembly? And the easiest way to do that, of course, is to make the parts, simplify them as much as possible so you have at least a placeholder that can be worked with. So say, in like as little as 10 minutes, you've got an initial rough drawing of a part, let's say right and it doesn't have to have the, all the details because the details can be uploaded as the next version of that file so you just like we do in our current workflow we do a design we upload initial cut we keep uploading new versions of that file with more and more detail or sometimes less detail as needed while making notes on what that part has in our part library in uh, in a version history of that part but the question I I had that still remains is if you change that part, the part that you started with significantly and in fact quite a bit, how does the final assembly still recognize that it's the same part, right? So for example, if you import into assembly 2, what if you imported a different file? Would a different file also get imported into this, like as a, instead of that one placeholder? Uh, maybe Roberto, maybe you can actually address this question. Like, how does does the import know that? Uh, does it have any limits to being able to import? Like, if you, for example, you're working on a part, but then you 
you change it so much that it effectively becomes a new part, will the assembly import still work? Roberto, can yes, you it, answer that? It, w it will work because the, um, the, the, that case is different from the editing apart case. So if, if the part that you, you are editing is totally, to, totally different, you can delete the part, the, the original assembly, and just import the new one and assembly assembly again. Uh-huh. And but the whole point of the assembly is that the constraints that already existed were kept upon the new import. Is that correct? Uh no. No no the the, the original part and the, and its constraint, constraints will be del deleted also. So you have to constrain again. So every time you import, the constraints do not get kept? So how do you... So what's the use of the... I'm not really clear about how useful um, is that? Because the idea, I thought it was that, you know, say you replace a part, it gets put into the correct place, and so you don't have to mess with it. So how can you achieve that part being put in the same place? That's by how you set up the origin in the original file? You see, uh, no. you see what I'm trying to say? Like if you just import a part, what if the part just ends up in some random location and then you have to do a bunch of work to get it into the correct location? How do you address that? Uh, I, I think that it's not... Uh, it's not different from imported uh, any part into the, the assembly. I mean, uh -huh. always when you when you want to import a part, you have to constrain that part with the rest of the assembly. Okay. So, if you want to change one of the assembled parts, you just have have to to do the same procedure. Okay, so if, so let me ask this. So if you have a part in an assembly and then you you make a minor change on the part outside of assembly and then you import it, the, the constraints do not keep at all? Yeah, and in, in that case the constraints will, will remain. Okay, I, so you, so for minor edits I, constraints remain, but for for great changes, in other words, different files, they don't. Is that right? Okay, okay, and the, but my question was still is remains un, unanswered. Is where is the limit to how much you can change a part before it loses its constraints? Um, I'm not sure at this point, but okay. I think that the limit is that if you modify the those planes or or those circular edge, edges edges uh -huh. that are constrained in the actual yeah I mean, in the current assembly okay so i have to work with that we'll see like so definitely we can make changes like for example when we had the drawer we cut out a circle in the side like we did uh and say we re-imported again as long as you know that circle did not interfere with any constraint i guess it would import properly yeah yeah right for, mm -hmm. i think for most of the cases uh, that we we need to modify some part, some assembled part. We we can use the edit and um, feature inside the assembly to workbench. In order, we can re, um, keep the constraints used for the assembled for the currently assembled parts. Right, and the way that the edit works, the edit works by taking you outside of that assembly and going back to the original file how does can you yeah. explain briefly how the yeah, edit works that, i i explained this in the in the workflow in the yeah so i i put this in the case of um the question is how to edit a part in the master card here um you have one well, i i can i can read the the steps the first step is download the, the latest version of the MasterCut. 
then mm -hmm. download the, the editable CAD file for the for the part to edit. Then open the MasterCAD and go to a 72 workbench. Then select the part to edit. Then change the source file path to the download downloaded CAD file in the property panel. Mm -hmm. Then right click on the part assembly 2 and edit. And it should open the part CAD file right, automatically. Right. right. Mm -hmm. So when you when you do that, when you click on the edit option, uh, FreeCAD opens the the, the part you want to edit if you do if you did the, the previous steps um, correctly yep. then you can edit yep. the part and save and then in the master card again uh, you can use uh, the, the proper tool to update the imported parts and finally finally you save and upload the new versions for yep. both the master card and the edited yep. part yep yep so essentially, when you edit, it takes you to an to the individual file, and you edit that individual file, and it imports it automatically, pretty much. Yes. Yep. Yep. Okay. No, that's good. That's very good. Okay. Okay. That sounds good. So yeah, I think we're on the way to um, an effective process. Um, yeah. So I'm thinking that if we do very rough, like so, with the parts, when we have a large number of parts, we start on a project we make an initial rough sketch I think as long as some of that rough sketch like for example it has like one plane that is the critical interface plane if that plane remains the plane against which we're constraining in the, say the final assembly as long as we have one good constraint point we can we can still import it import new versions properly while being constrained to the entire overall assembly so I think that's good for the workflow. I, we'll have to see how it works in practice, but the promise, the promise, like the dream here is that you get 100 people on a design and you can literally do a complete design in one day because you got 100 people times, say, you know, four hours or eight hours. So that's 800 hours of CAD time, you know, in a single day. That, I mean, that definitely gets you a full, full working assembly but the limit would be how quickly can you arrange those parts so the quicker you can import the initial parts into the final assembly the quicker you can you can um, build the entire thing so think about you've got a bunch of very rough parts you, you then you create a very rough assembly pretty quickly you know say within one or two hours three hours you've got a rough assembly with all the placeholder parts actually shown as blocks or blocky objects and then uh, as time goes on, for every new part that's updated, you can import those updates into the final master CAD, and you can see the final CAD morphing from this very rough structure to more and more perfect detail as each part gets completed and imported. So that's the kind of workflow we should be thinking about in our mind, that we see the whole final assembly in a rough shape and then keep refining part by part. Uh, with the work of individual people so that would be uh, if we can deliver that that would be really good um, so it's just uh, how you want I, I think how you want to think about it yep yes go ahead yeah if, if you have access to to people who can work on the on the code of the assembly to workbench uh -huh. maybe uh, it would be interesting if we can import modules um, besides the parts, because if we if we were able if we are able to assemble modules um, outside the MasterCAD and then assemble them inside the MasterCAD, uh, it it would be um, much more effective. Because we, we cannot work uh, at the same time in the MasterCAD. I mean, many people, how you said, yeah. working at the same time, that, that, that would, would be a problem. Yeah, that's, that's right. The, the trouble here is that, yes, everyone can work on the individual parts, but, but only one person can work on a MasterCAD. 
So it would have to be a linear process. It can't be paralleled on a master cat because otherwise there would be edit conflicts. Like if you upgrade one part and another person upgrades one part in another document, you have to merge those documents after that. So it would get messy. Right. So, huh. That's kind of... Hey, Martin? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you're familiar very much with, like, you know, the kind of how, like, in SolidWorks or more like the Autodesk stuff, they have a, a kind of a proprietary product data management workflow. Uh-huh. Um, and, you know, it, it kind of works similar to Git. And, yeah. You know, where you, you're checking things out and uh, you can kind of merge merge things together and then you know you're updating a, a component in an assembly or you're able to check something out to make sure that no one else can work on it uh -huh. while you're working on it um and i think that that could be a pretty valuable thing oh I, yeah i don't know a lot of open source stuff that is uh very good for hardware um stuff like huh. cad files um because one of the great things about git is you know you can uh, merge or you can you can see uh, you can use a diff and you can tell what the differences are you know and, and very quickly you can see the, the change um, and that's easy for much easier for code you know where it's written in human language and you you can visually see the points versus something in a hardware place and so yeah I, I think that um, there might be some value in looking at um, sort of version control system just uh, maybe out out in the future a little bit. I I, I agree with you know the, the workflow be needing to be there, but just so you can mm -hmm. kind of scale the system more. Yeah, no, that's right. We have to do that. So we have to be thinking about at least studying how that is done in industry standards. What it, what exactly is the system they could they use? We should also check in with the FreeCAD community because I know they they did have some talk about product data management. Absolutely. Okay. I mean, I know Yorick, one of the developers, has at least talked about it. Um, let's see, uncreated.net is his blog. But we can reach out to them. Uh, so let me put okay. that in the yeah. link. I know they've, they've uh, talked about it at least. Um, now look at that. Look at uncreated.net. Look at my screen. Guess yeah. what? That's FreeCAD and Blender. You like that? Yeah. The uh, Yorick works only in Blender and FreeCAD. So this is the kind of stuff we can be doing. It actually, yeah, we gotta maybe follow up with Yorick on that point. And in fact, I'll I'll just point them point him to this video. But basically, what exactly is the state of product data management that's capable within FreeCAD? Because I know that. Yorick has been developing that for the architecture workbench, for the architecture workflow, since he's an architect. And um, I'd like to just touch in with him, just asking what the status of that is and, and are people using that. Is that an experimental version? You have to kind of do some programming in there? Or is there a workflow that's pretty much um, well developed already that's good for production use? Yeah, so we'll we'll, uh, we'll ask Yorick about this to fill us in. There's, uh, there's the FreeCAD community of course there's the forums there uh freecad if you go to freecad dot i guess freecad dot freecadweb.org they have a forum so we can post a comment there or i could just email yorick but um they have a forum at freecad yeah it's i think it's about time that we really get some more sophisticated on this for now i think the work we're doing with the just individual parts and that workflow that's that's extremely helpful for right now and definitely will get us to a much farther place and m maybe we can start with that and possibly have two two kind of workflows for the i mean already we're like at the intermediate level with assembly two like the the most simple one was what i was trying to propose before initially was that Okay, you've got individual part files, and then you as, you just import them using merge into a final document. That's like the level one workflow, uh, and that works without enabling constraints. 
So that's entry level for a novice. Now second level is what we're getting into right now where we're merging, we're not using the merge function, we're using the import functionality of the actual assembly to workbench and that's what we're doing right now. And then next we are exploring what are the more advanced mechanisms for importing entire assemblies while checking that, yeah, like what you said, Josh, about checking parts out so that there's no co edit conflicts and stuff like that. How exactly does that work using existing tool chains that are available like GitHub? Because I know there's some GitHub integration for FreeCAD already. So we'll, we'll have to check in on that. But I think the level two, I think is quite um, good for us right now. And we might choose to use like level two or level three, depending on like what team we have. Cause, cause I would expect with level three, that might take some more skill and more understanding. Whereas like level two uh, and level one are lower and then level one compared to level two. I mean, I would say there's a definite serious level of sophistication between level one and level two and uh, I would say that for some projects if it's a simple if it's a simple design we can just operate at level one we just import and then you constrain so I think we can use all those three depending on a skill set of the of the people that are involved like depending on because I'm thinking for the long term you know we're gonna get a lot of developers some people are gonna be really skilled they can operate at level three with their eyes closed but new people coming on you still want to have them collaborate in large on a large scale and maybe you know maybe we we can have a mix of the dif three different levels operating uh, with an open source ecology so uh, use whichever one is most appropriate at the time for the audience that we have developing a certain project because we'll naturally break down into many different teams and have a lot of different projects going on as we uh, grow the the actual team yeah so okay. yeah go ahead uh-huh yeah if, if you see the in the free card in the arc um workbench like yeah architecture workbench yeah um if you go to the architecture menu uh, in the top okay i'm opening then on yep. to utilities Uh, I'm using Frica uh, point sixteen, and mm -hmm. so there in utilities you can see one option, which is commit with Git. Yeah. Yeah, look at that. So there is some of that. I was, uh, I was trying, I was trying to use that that option to 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 do commits and to the my, one of my repositories, but. I I couldn't make it work. Mhm. Mm yeah. Yeah. But maybe someone someone could could know how to use that because it's, it seems to be to be useful. Yeah. So under where uh, which which menu item? Under arch workbench. Architecture workbench. Yep. Yeah, arc utilities. Yeah, arc arch in the art menu uh-huh utilities utilities clone yeah. component I commit with git uh, oh, i commit. think you have you have not that yeah option. i have 17 so yeah okay i right. have that option in my in point 16. yeah okay well, I can open up 16. Yeah, I mean, it would take some figuring out, so we'll have to figure that out. But yeah, we'll have to get more sophisticated. For now, let's let's develop this one for now um, as like the intermediate step. Uh, I don't think we should like go straight to the most advanced workflow yet. Do you guys agree? I mean, definitely worthwhile to not like try to do the whole thing at once. I think we should do just w this one assembly part right now. Yeah, I just want, want to mention because uh, it, it could, uh, this could be useful for the future level. Yeah, definitely it will be useful for the future level. And yeah, I see the commit with git right here. And then there's BIM server. I mean, that's called building information management. So that's also related how you actually, that's product data management for buildings. 
So FreeCAD is there. We just would have to go through some more learning curve to get everybody on board on that. So let's not worry about it for now, but definitely in the future. Okay. So that's good. I have a, um, a crazy question related to this kind of stuff. Can, can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead. I'm wondering that uh, does assembly. Uh, that's kind of a little out there, but because OpenSCAD is code based, I'm just yeah. wondering if it's possible to uh, do certain code or certain functions to make this simple, or even if you could write enough code to help. I don't know, OpenSCAD, you know, it uses code to draw stuff, but I haven't used it enough. Uh, I've looked at it, but I think it works. So well, I'm I just think... curious uh, if it can... Uh, how you write might write code to assemble parts or if it has management for parts that way yeah I don't know how, what kind of management open scad has but definitely it's part of the workflow in that we can generate parts in open scad we'll probably leave the higher level assembly functionality to freecad I don't think open scad is designed for that it's just it's just co plain code I don't see much functionality there for assembling things not that I know of, but um, definitely useful. And then we can import from OpenSCAD, as we mentioned last week, I believe. Uh, you can convert from the the STLs into FreeCAD import, FreeCAD native. So that's there. We're pretty much set. I think the question you're asking for, I think we're we're set on that already. But probably we cannot expect the higher level assembly functionality from OpenSCAD. That's that would be my guess right now. Okay, so, okay, let's uh, just uh, go through just finishing up the meeting here. So, um, next on the agenda is uh, also also the tractor. So, we're getting set for, so if you look at page number four, uh, CV Power Cube is active. We, we do want to continue on a Power Cube CAD and finish that off and see if we, we can get the what we built fully CADed up. And see that within, if within CAD, we actually see different opportunities for making the design tighter. But the Power Cube design right now, as on slide number eight, makes it quite length, long lengthwise. And that may be all right, but as we do the CAD, we might discover something that, hey, maybe what if we put it there or elsewhere? You know, we might be able to rearrange some sizes and things. So. But the first step would be to cat up what we have already, because that's a workable power cube. That's a that's a good design. It works, and um, we can go from there as the next iterations. On the tractor part, so that kind of binds with the tractor team, because the tractor needs the power cube, and we want to do a four four power cube tractor workshop. So a tractor of 64 horsepower based on four power cubes, four engines, uh, at the end of October. And before that, do the CNC torch table workshop, an experimental one, on the 14th of October. So we're kind of still packing in all the schedule. Like every two weeks in October, we're going to have, like starting with the 3D printer on October, that's September 30, October 1. And then the torch table and the tractor. So the torch table, we're going to have to do this. I mean, we've got the torch table kind of in progress here. we got to do some redesign on it um, to get the motion perfected. But we've got like six weeks for the CNC torch table workshop where we prepare the base, just re re redoing the CAD, doing, um, doing some of the 3D prints for the improved parts, working out the long axis to make it a hollow axis instead of a so solid axis, which is much light, lighter weight. But yeah, so there's a few things there. That's that's on a plate, and because we need, we're gonna need that torch table for the tractor. So, but tomorrow, what we want to do is meet for the the tractor team, and we can discuss the power cube and tra and tractor in more detail, like really nailing out the power cube, just uh, putting together all the all the CAD and getting a workable power cube that's basically using that one power cube that we have. For the hydraulic tank and the other power cubes don't have to have a hydraulic tank so we're going to think about how do you make it most efficient so that you share the t hydraulic tank and then you have to have of course separate 
engine slash pump for the other power cubes, but you can share the cooler and you can share the hydraulic reservoir. So let's see how we can make that the most efficient design using the modularity and then going straight to the tractor design, which is the promise there is when we're doing a 64 horsepower, we should think as much as we can about doing it a mod like four scalable from one to four, like from one power cube to four power cubes. So what I'd like to do during that three days, so I have a 27 and eight, it should be tractor workshop. There should be three days there. Um, 27, let's see, August, September, October, 27, 8, 9, 27 through the 29th, three days. We build power cubes, we build individual tracked drive units, and then like a larger with larger one with either a larger frame or like multiple of these two small tractors like next to each other or something. Or even like four individual units of that tractor that are bound together because if each individual one is very tiny, you can actually connect them all up and maybe do an articulated steering version or or however but we're gonna have to think about like really maximizing the construction set approach because I want to have I definitely want to have like just for practice here a small one small garden tractor that could do all kinds of stuff from like moving earth to moving big hay bales like lots of different functions uh, mowing and other things lifting uh, trenching so, so a small tight one for construction and then a bigger one for for like larger larger scale earth moving and art agriculture and other other tasks so but let's do that tomorrow so so 1 p.m. like since we don't want to run this today let's do the 1 p.m. tractor meet tomorrow same time same place 1 p.m. for the continuing a power cube and tractor uh, so let's do that now as far as the roll division like what what exactly is the status of where we've gotten so far so if just just to reevaluate that real quick where we are in the power cube ver version 17.08 part library um, power cube version 17.08 cuz this is going to turn into power cube version 17.10 so the power cubes we're going to build in in October are going to be 17.10. But let's see let's see where we are in terms of the overall part library. I'm looking at the the MasterCAD checklist. Um, parts missing, mounting kit for fan. A few parts missing. Filter filler breather. Will hose bar. Michelle suction hose. 1.5 inch clamp. Expanded steel. Um, yeah, we've got a number of parts missing as far as the how the library looks here. Uh, yeah, we got to keep going at it. Um, yeah, there's a bit of parts. Uh, Roberto, how is the final assembly on it? Have you touched that, or what's the latest status on that that thing? The master. Let's see. Uh, August 29. Roberto did the, one of the la last versions. Let's see what that looks like for us here, just to see where we are for tomorrow. But we need to finish all that up. Any of the outstanding parts, we're going to have to... So tomorrow we'll discuss the design concept for the the small tractor and start maybe building up some parts. We do have some parts in the part library, like, for example, the universal rotor. I think that's in the part library from last year, actually. I, I believe Alec last year did that. Um, but let's see where we are in a power cube. Final um, master... I see there's a lot of constraints galore okay okay yeah yeah right and the realistic geometry is such that this is um, I mean we can I don't know maybe we could do like if we can fit all the parts into this one I mean we should go ahead but I mean in reality we found that we couldn't couldn't do it based based on the geometrical considerations if you look at uh, what you want to do for tomorrow's meeting is definitely take a look at the the video um, so if you look at the power cube slide there's a link to the geometry considerations video take a look at that to see how we can address all of them uh, and whether the design we have right now is value video uh, whether the design we have in this MasterCAD right now is going to be workable. 
I mean, this kind of looks like things may fit. Um, in this way, the the pump would be sticking out the back, but that could be could be workable. So we have to just keep assembling it to see if we can get all the hoses and try to reconcile that with the actual pictures of the as built. Look at the actual considerations, like where the suction hose and the return is and how much space they take. That could give us a lot of info in terms of uh, how the CAD that we have right now can all fit together. So please study those, those pictures in as much detail as you can to kind of get a feeling for where all the parts went because we know that this 2020 by 31 works so uh, I should put that this is 20 by 20 by 31 right now uh, the way we have it and if we can get it tighter that would be good I could probably see that uh, I'm looking at the engine shaft there and a the hydraulic pump I mean that I don't think we're going to need all that space there, like if you look at my screen, we can probably tighten that up a little bit because behind the pump there's going to be like three or four inches. Uh, we might not need all that space there. Uh, so we can kind of optimize the fit here and also say on the front of the engine, uh, looking from the front, it can possibly be pushed up like an inch or two to the front I don't know it's it's gonna be tight but I think we can do like if that pump goes on a shaft like right there it looks like we have a little bit of space for us to still close up that gap like that four inches behind the pump there that's so we can save so we'd be at 20 by 20 by 27 if it's 31 right now uh, but we also have to make sure that we can take the pump off the pump mount uh, when we are uh, so the pump can come off. We don't. We can't be close enough to the hydraulic tank in the back that the pump can't go backwards and co actually come out. So uh, we have to think about it. But if you want to take the pump off here, just a geometrical consideration, then you can also move the engine forward by removing the four engine mount bolts. So that's another option of how you actually remove the pump. Because I'm seeing like a good four inches that we can save by getting rid of that gap behind the pump here. So if we go 20 by 20 by 27, that's a reasonable, I mean, that's a nice size. That's a nice compact size for a power cube. So uh, that would be quite good if we can achieve that. So we can continue on working on this, this CAD here, working out all the details. And now it turns out, look at this. I mean, those vertical bars... It turns out we don't need them because we can mount the mesh directly and mount, mount the fan directly to the mesh, the, the cooler directly to the mesh. So the mesh acts as this, instead of these two vertical bars here, I mean this vertical and this vertical here, instead of those we're just mounting the mesh right across the, the body of the, the, the frame. So it's actually a much easier mounting system. So that's, that's good. Um, yeah, yeah. So let's, let's take this tomorrow. Uh, continue on this and so I'll discuss both the prime I mean I would say primarily the track I mean both tractor and power cube and we want to try to divide that as much as we can but we've got I mean let's see I mean if we look at our team numbers we got a you know we, we're up at you know over 200 hours per week but we should be able to to do quite a bit of work on this um, I mean we got to just basically roll we're talking about six weeks uh, we got all of September well all of September and all of October October 20 seven end of october full two months to get a design of the tractor so people we got to get rolling on this uh go all out on that so that we have a good design and we'll build it and and even if we don't have the torch table i mean the the bigger priority would be the the tractor like we assume that we're going to have the torch table but if we don't have the torch table we either get a lot of the parts cut or we just do it by hand like we did last time and it's not pleasant to do it all by hand so we probably just really, yeah, yeah probably like if we want to cut the tracks, we want to cut them by CNC, so just send it out to, to a fab shop. Uh, but hopefully we have our CNC torch table, and we will have to have it because we're going to do this experimental build workshop. So we'll do all the preparation on the torch table design 
uh, as much as we can using the the hollow shaft and I mean we did get a you know some XY motion we kind of found out that the axis is basically too heavy so we have to beef up uh, either lighten the axis by using hollow rods or strengthen up the drive the drive is plenty strong the belts start slipping so we just just fix that the the drive on the belts by using either wider belts like nine millimeter or twelve millimeter or by getting larger sprockets on the on the stepper motors so there's there's definite clear paths forward on a cnc torch table so i think we're quite good on that but we want to get everybody so every, all the osc devs we got to get people on the tractor and on the power cube let's just nail that out just like we did the filament maker i guess it's interesting how the filament makers are poster child but we kind of did spend a lot of time and got the complete thorough exhaustive design and part list for that so that's it's actually our poster child for some of the development we've been doing here um, so yeah, yeah, I think that's it. Uh, just the last thing I think, so Christian is here and, you know, is Christian still on? Christian, um, uh, we're, the thing we forgot to talk about is testing the ISO. So, so Christian, we're ready to download and test your stuff. I haven't done it myself, but, but we want to do it. Make sure all the software is there, right? Christian, can you pipe in a couple of my comments on that? Yeah, I'm here. Uh, yeah. I sent you the mail. Yes, you did. Uh, you got, you got it, right? Yes, so, yes. So, uh, it's, it's there. Unfortunately, um, I've tried further and my own USB stick didn't work, but right. it worked in a virtual machine and I'm a bit unsure whether it was on my side or mm -hmm. if it's on yours as well. Okay. I'll, of course, uh, go uh, work a bit here, but I'm not quite sure what it's about and I unfortunately have some problems here on setting up the, the software I, I told you about last week. So... Um, it's got more difficult because I want to set it up on a Raspberry Pi and this is RM and RM didn't support because there's some emulation war of this. Uh, it's, it's a bit complicated, however, um, I'll have to do it on a bigger uh, system and this on the other hand means that, uh, that the system that is at the moment down, we have to replace it or uh, get it up again or something like that. Uh, for that, I cannot set up my environment to mm -hmm. let's say update the ISO so um, until then you're stuck with that version <laughs> uh, let's see so I mean are you able to address this issue that you can actually update you know do whatever get whatever infrastructure you need to so you can actually test it without using virtual machine so um, uh, I think I, I can I can uh, set it up again. Yeah, but but uh, like I said, I was I was busy with uh, setting it up on RM, and that simply didn't work because I had to build many things myself, and uh, there were too uh -huh. many uh, variables, and it, it just didn't work. What's RM? Some, some ways. What's RM? Uh, that, that's the that's a processor structure. That's uh, the reason why not everything works on Raspberry Pi. That works on a normal machine. It's basically okay. the the main issue why the Raspberry Pi cannot take everything a normal computer can. Okay. All right. Well, a good start would be that the creator of that can use the ISO himself. So, but we can at this point download and test it ourselves, right? Yeah. Yeah, you should. Okay. And basically, if it's not working for you, just just tell me, and uh, then I know uh, that it's actually something with the with the image. Uh, okay. Like I said, the virtual machine actually uh, swallows it without any problems. So just maybe uh, I, d I don't even know what what I use. I think I use Rufus on Windows. So it may be if I just use a default image writer um, from from Linux that it just works. But like I said, that wasn't possible because the station here just uh, dropped out. Okay. So basically, slide number two is lists all the people everyone downloaded we we're putting your name here and tell us if it works for you and what issues you have um i also documented it i uh, i don't know but whether uh you've looked at it it's it's not probably it's not perfectly documented but as it is the first beta beta version i thought it's I just I just left every information I left you on an email plus one or two extra things, um, and I kept the rest of it for myself because uh, I just wanted to test it on this uh, new software I wanted to set up, uh, and then to derive uh, my my 
workflow with the software so we don't have two different uh, things standing there mm -hmm. hope that's all right yeah yeah okay so everyone pretty much uh, will we'll, everybody you got to download it because this is very important like this is our ISO official Linux distribution where you have all the software preloaded so that all the workbenches for FreeCAD like the 3d printer software uh, Arduino environment I mean there's Cura whatever work tools we're using you have all on a one one distribution that just works it's on your uh, USB thumb drive that you can run on your computer to nail down any kind of software variations for workflows because that's going to be very important like we want to make sure that once we get into the flow of doing things efficiently that the software issues are not getting in our way so we got to test it so everybody um, page two uh, download so download uh, download the ISO You'll need at, the at least 8 gigabytes, I'm afraid, because it's uh, about 3.9 gigabytes at the moment, and this will be uh, not enough with a, with a 4 gigabyte stick, probably. Just just saying for for your information, because of all the software we now have, and that's there out of the box, it takes just some space. I, I hope everyone uh, has some stick for that. Okay, okay. It's... So... Um, I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, go ahead. Yeah, a hash would be useful. You're probably right, but it's it's inside actually. Um, the mo most interesting uh, part of it, uh, the, the the file system itself, uh, has an MD MD5 hash sum. So if you mount the ISO, you can actually see the MD5 uh, sum of the, of of the actual um, of, the, of the actual system. Uh, if that's not enough, uh, I'll, I'll provide you one. But I think Google Drive is pretty, pretty uh, persistent. Is that some kind of an animal? What's MD5? That's <laughs> so, sounds nice, right? Uh, it's it's basically a way of of um, assuring that that um, a file or anything actually is is the fi file it is. So it's like um, doing a con complex algorithm with every byte that's included and getting out of it uh, um, a sum, so, so a large number or with, with, with letters and stuff. And, you mean uh, for, is this for, that. sorry, is that for download purposes? It's a, it's a checking system for downloading yeah. something, correct? Yeah, ma mainly, mainly it's for, for download purposes, right? Exactly. Okay. All right. So... Yeah, everybody download it, see if it works for you. 3.9 gigs, so it's going to take you some time overnight. Whatever, unless you have fast internet. Um, so All right. Uh, we, we, could, we could also, uh, when, when we're at some, some at a good point, we could also try to, to, to share that uh, over, over BitTorrent, or, or how do I understand that, Abe? I, I'm not, I didn't get that quite right, but I could host it via BitTorrent. It's no problem. Actually, it sounds it sounds good to me because uh, we could distribute it all uh, with each other. That's that sounds actually pretty nice. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, is, well, let's is, see how the first step works and see how many people get it going. See see what we need to do next. So okay, but everybody, this is important. The OSCI ISO. We want to make it work. Um, which is used. You know, this is going to be used everywhere. So. Um, and okay. If, just, just a little thing. Uh -huh. uh, one last thing because Abe wrote that as well. Um, the the ISO is it has a live version, so yeah, you can just use the thumb drive. You don't need to install anything. And, right. Uh, you of course when when you're using the live CD, nothing on it is safe. That's just just the way that is. But it's uh, you can just use that and. Let's say uh, save the rest. Uh, you you modify it in the cloud, and we'll adjust everything uh, from the settings and everything. Uh, we'll adjust that on the live CD, so you don't have to modify anything as soon as we are uh, over this version. Yeah. Right, so which is which is still consistent with our workflow because you can edit the wiki, you can do Google Docs, you can you can create 
uh, FreeCAD files, but you just can't save them on your desktop, so it forces you to upload it to the wiki. So th that's just the just the workflow, which should be happening anyway, right? Yeah, it's it's just a feature. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. So we'll talk. We'll talk again tomorrow, um, everybody. Um, let's get around the tractor and power cube doing that. Uh, show up tomorrow, 1 p.m. If you can make it. And we'll talk. We'll talk then. I do think we should also ho host a design sprint this Saturday to get everybody cranking on the tractor. So uh, after we talk tomorrow, I do want to announce a, a tractor design sprint starting this week. So we've got, as I said, two months, two full months at this point for a design. Whatever we have designed, we're building because we got to keep prototyping the next and next iterations like we always do. We can get a lot of work done in in two months with 20 people. So uh, focus on getting a, an excellent version of the tractor for the next build. So with that said, thanks a lot, everyone. Uh, keep going. We're producing some good product. I think we're getting some of our team building and processes in place. So I think things are coming together as we make the road by walking here. Okay. So thanks, everybody. And we'll hopefully see you tomorrow and then over the design sprint weekend on Saturday. Bye-bye.